Okay, good evening, everybody. I see that uh, the audience is coming in into this room for the new webinar that the Austrian Economic Centers and uh, Confederate are organizing in our Austrian Economics Monthly. And every end of the uh, every end of the sorry phone call coming in every end of the uh, month we go every Thursday end of the month, and this is the ninth time we started exactly. Uh, uh, nine months ago, 10 months ago, after the pandemic started in uh, March, unfortunately, you guys remember. And here we are every month with our seminar in this wonderful joint venture. And we've been covering several uh, 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 arguments and issues. And last time we talked about uh, the fear for salt and sugar and for uh, uh, saturated fats. And today, instead, we're talking still about a, a, a fear, the fear for cryptophilia or actually the ECB's cryptophilia and the EU cash phobia. So the fear is for cash and the love is for, for cryptophilia or for cryptocurrency. Um, let me introduce briefly our guest. And as usual, you can find all their bios because uh, on their on our website, compedra.eu on the Austrian economics website as well. Uh, and, uh, a member of parliament, Hans Olaf Enkel and welcome very much to be here and then our great friend Martin Guninger, that is member of the Austrian Economic Center, but today is going to speak uh, about uh, cryptocurrency. And then uh, from the GUSA, we have Torsten Pole, and help me with the pronunciation. As you guys know by now, my pronunciation for names is horrible, but that's what characterized me. And so you will definitely apologize me. Uh, let's not forget that we are broadcasting live on Zoom where you can post questions in the chat and the question and answer in the chat section. And don't forget to do it. And on Facebook, if you're on Facebook, you can interact on our websites, but it's hard for us to read all your question or all your argument. The purpose of these seminars is to debate and to act in a very classical liberal style with a sense of criticism and, you know, always doubt and always criticize what is on the uh, table. So let me go to the topic very quickly because it's also uh, one of our style is smart brevity, being smart in, you know, a few minutes. And usually we end around the 45 minutes. So we kind of compress this field of debate. And of course, the debate is recorded so you can re-watch re it again. Or again, you can discuss on your own inside your organization or wherever you are around the world. And I'm, I love to say that our webinars are followed all around the world. Uh, so we are people that are watching from Asia, from Americas, from Africa, and of course, from uh, Europe. Despite, you know, it's not always the best time. So we go at six o'clock. I know somebody complains and wants to have an earlier start, but, you know, six o'clock is kind of uh, good for Europe and, and the US and we try to get some people in Asia as well. But let's uh, let's go to the topic, the ECB's cryptophilia and the EU cash phobia. Okay, so we know that now there is this trend in uh, a currency and cryptocurrency, but particularly there is an attention by the Fed in the United States and of course by the European Central Bank here in Europe, try to of course come up with a European uh, a cryptocurrency and try to regulate what is supposed to be right now a very free or depending on how you see it, a very wild uh, market. But let me get exactly and right away to our guest and particularly to the member of the European Parliament, Mr. Hans Olaf Henkel. What is happening with the ACB? Are we going to have a European uh, a cryptocurrency that is competing with other currency? What will be with the Euro and how the Euro will relate with this cryptocurrency? and uh, how this was going to be uh, regulated. And then as a member of parliament, don't you think that there is some phobia, some fear for cash? And if I think about my country, Italy, there is somehow a war against cash, trying to digitalize all the money and kind of force people to use a uh, credit card. You know, I'm a great credit card lover just because I'm annoyed to go around with cash, but you know, there's also people that wanna go around with cash. So Mr. Henkel, the word and the floor is yours five, six minutes, and then we turn to our uh, to our other uh, guest. And again, I saw people joining. Thank you very much for being here with us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, good evening or good morning or whatever. Let me first just uh, uh, correct one uh, thing you said. I have left the European Parliament uh, last year. 
but uh, nevertheless, uh, but you I'm, keep the course, title. You keep the title. That's no, a very important thing. Well, I'm oh, you lost. You lost it. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, yes. <laughs> Fortunately, oh, you have the pension. At least you have the pension. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I spent all my life uh, in business, and only the last five years of my life in politics, and that was indeed until last year in the European uh, Parliament. <clears throat> By the way, the only reason why I joined politics and finally joined the European Parliament was my opposition to the Euro policy of the European Central Bank and the German government. But let me uh, first uh, reflect on the title of this uh, meeting here. You talk about ECB's cryptophilia and EU's cash phobia. Uh, I do agree that there is a cash phobia in the EU and I will talk about it a little later, but uh, I do not really agree with the assumption that there is a cryptophilia in the ECB. If you look at the uh, typical uh, Wikipedia and so on definition of cryptophilia, by the way, that word existed even before uh, cryptocurrencies existed, then you will see that uh, cryptophilia is a strong sexual desire to uh, towards mysterious creatures. And uh, uh, why uh, the cryptocurrency could be regarded as a mysterious creature, I don't think that the ECB has a strong desire towards it. Uh, <clears throat> as we all know, a cryptocurrency is a form uh, of, of payment uh, that can be uh, exchanged online for goods and services. And the reason for uh, people investing in cryptocurrencies, by the way, there are more than 6,000 different cryptocurrencies already in the world. The reasons are in my view threefold. One is uh, people expect uh, some profit if they invest in this futuristic pro project. You saw just uh, the big, in uh, big investment of Elon Musk in this uh, Bitcoin currency, which is the, of course the biggest uh, uh, cryptocurrency existing at the moment. And uh, the other reason, <clears throat> the second reason is uh, they want to, and here's my theory, they want to remove themselves from the effects of uh, the policy or policies of the ECB, especially in Europe or central banks in general. And finally, they are intrigued by the technology, the, technology which is regarded as a very safe technology. But there are some risks, uh, there are some reasons not to invest in this in this uh, a cryptocurrency. Uh, of course, it is a speculative idea. And if you invest in this currency, you must you uh, invest in it uh, in, in, in the expectations that somebody later will pay you more than you paid yourself. Uh, number two, another reason to be very careful is that it lacks the stability. Uh, I might remember, uh, re might remind you of the fact that in uh, December 2017, uh, a Bitcoin was worth $2,000. A year later, uh, uh, it has dramatically shrunk and today it's worth more. And I think even Elon Musk has meanwhile lost some money. So uh, I think there is a clear trend towards digitalization. And here I do agree that the European Central Bank is uh, looking at and investing into a digital currency, or let's say in a digital Europe, but uh, that is not to be confused with the uh, cryptocurrency, which we, I think, talk about in the title. Uh, let me also <clears throat> say that so far, uh, no central bank has come up with a digital currency, uh, neither the ECB nor the Fed nor any other. And uh, in my view, also uh, the European Central Bank, and I have uh, looked at some statements by Madame Lagarde, the president of the European Central Bank, uh, they don't really uh, support it. I think they are very critical towards a cryptocurrency, but they are very amenable to digitalization of the euro and are investing in this. Uh, finally, <clears throat> let me also uh, say that the ECB has good reasons to be nervous about uh, cryptocurrencies. 
because uh, a cryptocurrency, of course, challenges the monopoly of central banks. And I have never in my uh, business life seen a monopoly which is voluntarily giving up its monopoly. It always was forced by, uh, by uh, authorities to, uh, to give it up or, or split it with some others. It uh, <clears throat> also competes, if you wish, with the rather aggressive monetary policy of the ECB. And here I really mean the ECB because as a result of all those savings packages in order to save the Euro, which uh, some of them I have opposed and I have also myself uh, gone to the German Federal Constitutional Court and uh, by the way, last year got some victory with my, uh, with my complaint. Uh, the ECB's balance sheet now uh, consists of 61% of uh, GDP uh, versus, uh, uh, you know, the, versus the, uh, the United States Fed, where it's only 34 percent. So my, uh, <clears throat> my, my issue is uh, there is a lot of, or my observation is there is a lot of hesitancy by all central banks towards cryptocurrencies, but especially with the ECB. Uh, <clears throat> perhaps I should also mention one reason why uh, and now I get to the cash phobia, where I fully agree. Uh, it is very interesting to see the reason which um, Draghi, the current <laughs> prime minister of Italy and ex-president of the ECB, when he stopped the printing of 500 euro currency notes, he used a very strange argument for a central banker. He said he wants to, he wants to fight uh, drug trafficking. Well. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, no central bank has in its rules the fight against crime uh, or against traf uh, drug trafficking. Of course, there's something else behind it. And uh, uh, not only deflects this, this criticism towards uh, the cryptocurrency and, for instance, uh, other things, it deflects from the uh, criticism from the bubble of uh, 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 the increasing uh, government bonds, which are held by the ECB. As far as the cash phobia is concerned, also that exists, by the way, a long time before the ECB was even founded. Uh, cash phobia is a word which, which describes people who are afraid of money for various reasons. Uh, by the way, in Corona times, you now have people who are afraid of touching money because they uh, afraid of catching the virus. Uh, so this cash phobia really exists in the EU and especially in the ECB. And I think for a very simple reason. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, some time ago, I think three or four years ago, the EU came up with a rule that you cannot go travel from Austria to Germany with more than 10,000 euros cash without declaring it. I mean, that is uh, in a common market with a common currency union, something really crazy because you don't need to declare when you travel from Hamburg to Bavaria. But here's one uh, example. I gave you the other example that you cannot anymore print 500 Euro notes. Uh, and the reason for that is very simple. The ECB wants to continue with their negative interest policy. And it needs to, because otherwise countries like Italy and Spain would would uh, probably collapse because if interest payments uh, are going up, then of course uh, the government budgets will uh, explode. And that's one of the major reasons why you have this cash phobia in the EU and in the ECB. Thank you so much, Mr. Henkel. And uh, thanks for, for your valid inputs, particularly the last one explaining why there is this cash phobia. We have also to add that if I look at it from the privileged position of being an Italian, it's also a matter of tax evasion. So the fact that uh, with digital money, there is uh, more control than of course you have, uh, you have with cash. And uh, here in Italy, at least, I don't know about other countries, but uh, we have a limited also withdrawal of money if we go to a bank. So if we get if we ask for more cash, we have to sign a, a, a pledge basically that uh, uh, makes us uh, uh, liable for the money that we go and, and withdraw. But let me and thanks for 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 your comment. I'm coming back to you. But let me move to Martin Grudinger from 
the Austrian Economic Center. And Martin, you, I'm expecting from you a very liberal or even libertarian approach to this. Uh, so in a way, I suppose that you are in favor of the cryptocurrency and at the same time in favor of cash. So it's up to the individual uh, to choose what to use. Am I right? Well, you, uh, you're kind of right. But let me start uh, by saying something which um, Dr. Henkel already touched upon, um, and that is distinguishing digital currencies from cryptocurrencies, because I think there is some confusion about that. Um, in cryptocurrencies, cryptographic algorithms and principles from game theory are used to achieve some kind of decentralized consensus on which transactions should be included in the blockchain. Um, and that, that is in contrast to a digital currency, at least as I would define them, um, there is some central institution which decides which uh, transactions are permitted. So in essence, cryptocurrencies cut out the central authorities. The ideas of, of cryptocurrencies and digital currencies are in essence pretty old. Uh, they first came up in the 1980s. They were heavily discussed in, in some movements which sprung up uh, around the same time and are closely related to each other, which are uh, the cypherpunk movement on the one hand and the crypto anarchist movement on the other. Um, in 1994, I think it was, there was an attempt to make a, crypt, uh, a, a digital currency, and this was called eCash. It was uh, established by a pioneer in the crypto uh, scene called David John. Um, and this was a, a centralized currency still. And the next evolutionary step that happened in 1998. There were two concepts, namely Bitgold and Bcash presented, and these were both already cryptocurrencies. So they were decentralized then. And in 2008, uh, the Bitcoin white paper was published. And in the beginning of 2009, there was um, the, the, the genesis block of, of, Bit, of Bitcoin created. And at that time, almost nobody recognized what a major event took place then. And yeah, the, the rest, as they say, is history. Um, the, the two most important features, in my opinion, of cryptocurrencies are that they can't be controlled or managed by a central institution, thereby bringing down political risk, decreasing costs of political opposition and increasing stability. And they are transportable via a communication channel and that drastically potentially decreases trans transaction costs. Let me illustrate why I'm a, a a huge fan of, of cryptocurrencies. Um, I want to invite you to a thought experiment. Imagine there was an organization that leaked classified information to the public, classified government information to be precise. Information documenting uh, the mass surveillance of citizens, corruption at the highest levels of government, Highness war crimes. Now imagine that the government is not at all happy about this and therefore tries to make sure the organization can't finance these operations any longer. They shut down all payment channels to this organization in the banking system. They even pressure private companies like PayPal, Western Union, Visa, MasterCard, into shutting down all the all dealings with this organization. They all comply because they fear what would happen to them if they if they don't comply. And suddenly the organization can't get any donations anymore and is on the brink of, of going bankrupt. 
you can now stop imagining what I just wanted you to imagine actually happened. And it happened in 2010 and 2011. The organization I'm talking about here is WikiLeaks. One major reason why WikiLeaks survived that time is that they accepted donations via Bitcoin, which is pretty much immune against such government pressure because of the way it works. If all transactions are done with digital currencies via the banking system and controlled and, and monitored by the government, you risk your livelihood by doing something the government doesn't want you to do. This is potentially the end of individuality and diversity. Opposing the government in that scenario could mean death by starvation. And this is why I think it is essential that we fight for cryptocurrencies and at the same time oppose centralized digital currencies. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I was reading some comments and questions that we got here, particularly one from uh, Peter Forster that is on in, in our chat. Thanks, Martin. Uh, but you, I'm coming back to you with, with a, the issue of cash because you have not answered my question on cash. I'm coming back to you because I, I want to hear what you think. So be ready for that. But let me move to our next guest. And uh, this is Thomas uh, uh, Fouillet and uh, helping again with pronunciation. Who is working and running the GUSA gold and, uh, and silver? And you, of course, you can visit the website. And uh, Thorsten, you can give us this what this in terms of cryptocurrency and work to cash means for a business like yours that I assume is mostly happening online. Uh, thank you, Pietro. I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate in today's webinar and I hope you can hear me. Yes, absolutely. Okay, excellent. So please let me start by reminding ourselves that the euro is a fiat currency monopolized by the European Central Bank. And as you, as you all know, fiat money suffers from economic and ethical deficiencies. Fiat money is inflationary. It benefits a few at the expense of many others. It causes boom and bust cycles and it leads the economies into a situation of over indebtedness. The planned digital euro will be fiat money, just as much as the euro cash and euro bank balances represent fiat money. They are all created out of nothing by the ECB and euro area commercial banks. Just as, is, as it is the case with the existing euro, the quantity of digital euro can be increased at any time. It is uh, backed by nothing and it carries a 100% risk of devaluation. As noted earlier, a digital euro would be a fiat euro. The digital euro can either be account-based, so you keep it in an account held with the ECB, or it can be token-based. Money users receive a token that can be transferred from smartphone to smartphone via an app. Uh, hoping for anonymity in payment transactions would be futile in both cases, uh, one has to fear. A look at China probably shows where the journey is headed. The Chinese digital central bank money is supposed to have a so-called controlled anonymity. In other words, only the People's Bank of China, and that is the Chinese Communist Party, should have access to the payment transaction data. The ECB says the digital euro is complement to cash and bank balances but that's not really convincing to me because those who pay in cash obviously find it convenient to and want to ensure their anonymity. Otherwise they would pay electronically, that is transfer balances through PayPal, Apple Pay, or use debit or credit cards. In this context, it should also be noted that people don't just hold cash for payment purposes. They also demand it to protect themselves against bank failures, for example, <clears throat> or they also hold cash to be liquid, even uh, in, for events like uh, power outages or to be independent of internet and online banking. 
And that said, the suspicion that the ECB is more interested in taking cash out of circulation cannot be refuted easily. But if only electronic payments are possible, so in a cashless society, what little remains of financial privacy will be gone. The citizens become, the citizens become completely transparent, much to the liking of the state. As soon as cash has been pushed back or stripped away entirely, monetary policymakers can implement an uninhibited negative interest rate policy to devalue debt. Customers, bank customers, can no longer get out of the bank balance sheet. The final, the final escape door is then locked. The door is wide open then for financially suppressive government policy, leaving citizens basically defenseless. It is unlikely that a digital euro will prevail naturally against cash. Rather, the ECB will have to make the use of cash <coughs> unattractive by raising the cost of cash holdings increasing fees at ATMs or through upper limits for cash payments or through social stigmatization of cash. Keywords are money laundering, terrorist financing, etc. The digital euro does not compete with crypto units such as Bitcoin. After all, a digital euro is, as already mentioned, fiat money issued by the state. And this is exactly what all those who are looking for better money do not want to hold. Rather, the target group for the digital euro includes those who are basically content with the euro as it currently is, and those who are worried about a potential banking crash. This group probably represents a fairly large number of people who come into, que who, who come into question as a potential target clientele for the digital euro. Now, here's the deal. The plan is to allow for a one-to-one -one exchange of euro cash and euro commercial bank balances into the digital euro. Economically speaking, this means, and this is really important, that the ECB ensures the liability of all euro banks. The ECB transfers its credit worthiness, which is of course beyond, uh, beyond any doubt stellar, to euro commercial banks. Because a one-to-one -one exchange option, nobody has to worry about losing their money balances held at Euro commercial banks, as the ECB has a monopoly of Euro production. It cannot go bankrupt. It can create Euros at any time to settle its payment obligations, regardless of the amount. Having said that, no one needs to worry that the balances held at commercial banks could be lost if the bank, if a bank goes bankrupt and the deposit protection fund fails. If a digital Euro is publicly accepted, the scenario of Euro commercial banks collapsing becomes unlikely. The Euro money and credit system would be supported more than ever by the omnipotence of the ECB. In fact, the monetary system in the Euro area would become something like a planned economy style monetary system. It would amount to a de facto nationalization <laughs> or socialization of the monetary system. It would speed up the way towards socialism in the Euro area. This is my concern. So let me come to the end of my admittedly one-sided and highly critical remarks about the ECB's plan to issue digital Euro central bank money. I hope I succeeded in pointing out that my criticism of a digital Euro is part of a broader critique of states monopolizing money, of central banking, of fiat money. For fiat money is incompatible with freedom and prosperity. Freedom and prosperity requires sound money and the digital euro wouldn't be sound money. Actually, I fear it would be even worse than the euro in its current form. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Thurston. And we're certainly coming back to you. I want to remind everybody that is following us, particularly on Zoom, that you can ask questions. There were already a couple of comments. So please go ahead if you have any comment or if you have any question, and be happy to read and share the question with the rest of the panel. Uh, uh, Mr. Henkel, I'm coming back to you. Uh, regarding exactly what was mentioned by Martin and, uh, and just right now by, by, by Thurston, that there is a, a risk of a sort of, I wouldn't say socially, I would say totalitarian approach by the ECB. And uh, in a way, we definitely need cash as also a form of individual freedom, if I can translate this. And protection, you know, starting from the protection of our personal data 
uh, uh, alias our privacy. Is this a, a vision that you share? Is this a vision, uh, particularly including Thurston uh, uh, idea that we can endorse in a way to protect our freedom and to protect our liberties? Uh, yes, uh, basically, yes. Uh, number one, I think uh, any move to eliminate cash is indeed a, a gross uh, infringement of uh, freedom in general. I think we are all uh, okay here and all agree with that, uh, number one. Number two, um, I do not think we can or should avoid uh, a digital currency. I have a problem uh, with the European Central Bank's policy, I mentioned that. I have a problem with the Euro in general because uh, the Euro is a, a one size fits all currency uh, in uh, 19 different countries, uh, which are totally different. There is a, a remarkable difference between, let's say, the economy of Italy and the economy of Germany. In order to save the euro, the ECB is not uh, changing the currency, but it tries, or the politicians try to change the economies. And I think a currency should reflect the reality of an economy. And an economy should not be uh, changed in order to reflect the demands of a central bank. So I do agree with all that. Uh, I slightly disagree with the, with the uh, criticism of the digital uh, form of euro. While I do agree that it enhances the capability of the central bank uh, to do even more harm than they do today, I think there is no way we uh, can avoid uh, to uh, pay not only in cash if we don't want to pay in cash. Uh, I think we should also recognize the freedom not to have to pay in cash. And uh, you find vast differences, by the way, in the European Union. Uh, Sweden, which does not belong to the euro, but uh, Sweden has a very high uh, uh, percentage of people who don't pay in cash as compared to Germany. And Corona, as I mentioned before, has changed already that. So I think we need a digital version of the euro, but we need to make sure, and here I do agree with uh, Mr. Pollard, we, we must make sure that the European Central Bank doesn't abuse it. And in fact, it has abused already the current uh, euro currency quite a lot. And uh, finally, a very, I think a very important point, uh, the European Central Bank needs to continue its negative interest policy. Otherwise, uh, the economies in this one size fits all euro zone will, some economies will collapse. Uh, it is obvious that for the Italian industry, the euro is too strong. And it is obvious for the German industry, and I was for many years in charge of German industry, the euro is too weak. So no wonder that uh, the business uh, in, in uh, Italy collapsed when the euro came and no wonder that Germany can swamp the rest of Europe and the world with its rather undervalued exports. So uh, I do agree, agree with all, all of that. Uh, I'd like to add one other thing. Let's get back to the cryptocurrency, which uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Paganini has uh, rightfully differentiated. No, sorry, uh, it was the, the, the other gentleman. Uh, Martin, yes. Yes, Martin. he has rightfully uh, uh, and fortunately differentiated. Uh, while I was mentioning some pros and cons of a cryptocurrency, I do believe we should allow that to happen. So uh, competition to central banks is only good, but my feeling is uh, that will not happen. And the first criticisms of members of the board of the ECB are already get going into that direction. By the way, this uh, cryptocurrencies are forbidden in China uh, and for the same reason as where uh, earlier I mentioned even digital currencies uh, are to be uh, uh, viewed critically in China because of the lack of uh, protection of the uh, of, of data protection and privacy. Thank you so much, Mr. Mr. Henkel. I, I, I'm, I have to say that I, I'm being distracted because I'm receiving some messages not here in the chat, but of people that are complaining that actually cash should remain and uh, the fact that 
particularly here in Italy, as I mentioned earlier, there is, uh, earlier you mentioned a way to get away from cash uh, 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 to make, you know, for instance, withdrawal more expensive from bankomat or, or ATM. Uh, here we have an opposite way that is the one of somehow providing incentives in using uh, credit cards and in using, uh, 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 for instance, uh, digital, um, digital money. Before coming to Martin, uh, uh, I want to go, I want to very briefly, uh, um, going back to um, Mr. Polate, but I don't see him anymore. Is he still here with us? Yes, I'm. I'm yes, with he, yeah, there you are. Sorry, it's uh, too many people on the screen here. Uh, my question is, my question, it comes from Mises. The question is, uh, what's the point, is a provocative question, what's the point then in keeping commercial banks after the digital euro? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, you know, I try to frame my, my remarks uh, by taking a critical view of how this fiat money system works. And uh, my point is that issuing a digital euro or a digital um, central bank money, which, which should be a substitute for cash, is a fundamental change basically of the whole monetary system. Um, I try to describe it as the central bank underwriting all liabilities of the commercial banking industry. So basically you do no longer need commercial banks. And this is a, is it, it's a, it's a fundamental change of the, of, the, of the structure of the financial system that comes with the issuance of digital central bank monies. And don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm, I also use credit cards and I love to do online banking, but I think uh, I, I, at times I like to use cash. And um, in a free society, people should be free to choose Unfortunately, we have a money supply monopoly where central banks have monopolized currencies. So if they take away cash, we do not have any alternative to use. And unfortunately, we have now this crypto space where people are trying to come up with better and sound money, like Bitcoin is a can potential candidate, Ethereum is a potential candidate. And that this shows that people are looking out for better and sound money. And as I tried to say, the digital euro is not better money. It's even worse. It, it basically leads to a nationalization, so to speak, of the, of, the, of the financial and banking industry. And you end up with a banking system like in the Soviet Union, where you had a central bureau, namely the ECB, uh, governing council here in Frankfurt deciding interest rates. Markets have no longer say in concerning credit premiums, liquidity, etc. It's a nightmare. I would I would argue. Uh, <laughs> we understand. It's 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 far from from being you know um, a, a harmful development that the ECB tries to unfold. Thanks, Thurston, also for the reference to the role of the central bank and the risk of, again, a totalitarian approach to this. Martin, let me come to you because we are going toward an end, and I understand it's also uh, part of late evening uh, uh, for many people around Europe, so we want to get close to our ending. Uh, Martin, we got so many, you know, points talked, uh, discussed here, you know, cryptocurrency, digital money, uh, cash, the role of, this, of the central bank. In a way, uh, Thurston is right. There is a, a sort of, again, totalitarian role of the European Central Bank. But what if we have organization companies like Facebook or eventually in future other companies that are issuing uh, their own currency? Is this something good for individuals? It sounds so. But what kind of protection as well we have for individuals? And don't we risk a, an excess of monopoly? Yeah, thank you. I, I will come back to this question later, I, I promise it. But before that, you asked another question regarding uh, cash. Cash, yeah, 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 you're right. You, yeah. you meant a word. No, I, want to, I, I want to answer. Um, let me say in, in the context of government money, I think cash is absolutely essential to preserve freedom. Uh, and by the way, in the same context, I think it's also crucial that the money is linked to, for example, precious metals 
to counter the in inflationary tendencies of governments. However, I'm not a fan of, of government monies, uh, as you can maybe tell. Um, and, and that's why I prefer private cryptocurrencies as opposed to the, the governmental digital currencies um, creating what was essentially just said, creating a, a centralized digital currency would be a major step back um, and a very dangerous one considering what governments have historically done to, to non-digital currencies already. Um, yeah, on, on organizational um, money, Honestly, I have a little bit of, of problems with that. I, I of, of course, I, I wouldn't outlaw it or, or something like that, but I'm not a fan of, of Facebook issuing money. I have, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of big, almost monopolies issuing money because that's just um, a, a state growing um, out of a, a, a company more or less. And I prefer real private money. I, I see that as, as three categories of money there. I see private money, I see organizational money, and I see government money. And my preferred money is the private one. However, I, I have to say that probably organizational money would be better than government money just because they don't have the, the force apparatus of the state behind them, at least yet. Um, and then I, I want to say something about what, what Mr. Henkel said about the, the um, laws in China, outlawing cryptos in China. Um, first of all, um, th this reminds me of how uh, Timothy May, which is uh, a, a cypherpunk, um, started his his, um, his crypto anarchist manifesto, and it was a specter is haunting the modern world, the specter of crypto, uh, and this is exactly what's happening there. Maybe we we can say a specter is haunting central banks, the specter of cryptocurrencies. Um, more than that, um, one has to consider that. If crypto is outlawed, only outlaws have crypto. Um, and it, it's not at all crypto or, or laws against cryptos were tried again and again. China is not the first country, by the way, trying that. There were many countries trying that before. It's just not working. It's not working at all. Um, the, the best argument for crypto is a law against crypto because it shows that it, it shows why we need crypto to to defend against against laws which are essentially I think illegitimate. Um, and one thing I have to say um, on the the maybe difference between technology and laws. Um, I think we have to change our mindset. Laws will not protect our, our, our rights, our individual rights. We have to look for technology to protect our rights. We have to switch from laws to protect our rights to technology that protects our, right, our, our rights. Um, and maybe the last sentence, um, I would say that politics has unfortunately never given us lasting freedom and it, it unfortunately probably never will. That's why we need technology. Thank you, Martin, uh, for this very pessimistic uh, last statement. Well, let, me get, let me get to Mr. Henkel just to conclude and then I will go back to Thurston for a very last remark. Uh, Mr. Henkel, uh, you, you mentioned and, and, and Thurston mentioned of the superpower of the European Central Bank. But as a former member of the European Parliament, is there anything that the Parliament, the European Parliament that represents us, represents citizens, can do, should do, or would do, or probably is already doing, and I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a bit of a neophyte here, uh, uh, to protect us, to protect our freedoms? 
Oh yes, uh, look, uh, the, the only reason why I went into politics after a business career was my opposition to the policies of the ECB. Uh, originally, I was not against the euro. Uh, when the euro was introduced, uh, the politicians uh, made a lot of promises. And uh, when the first crisis came uh, in Greece in the year 2010, then all those promises were broken. And that's, that was for me the uh, in, initiation to decide to uh, form a new political party in Germany, which unfortunately had been hij hijacked by rightist extremists. So I had to leave it after a year and a half. But for me, this was a reason to go into politics. And when I went into the European Parliament, I made a few observations, uh, which, uh, which of course are not new for you, but I think they are important. Number one, we still have a number of countries in the EU which are not in the Eurozone. Although with the exception of Denmark, they should have been in the Eurozone. And uh, uh, number two, if you look at the uh, uh, economic performance of the non-Euro non countries in the EU and compare that with the rest of the Eurozone, you find out they did so much better. That, that speaks not a, in favor of the Euro. And you can ask the Swedes, uh, which by the way should have been in the Euro a long time ago, why they still are not in the Euro. I think they have their good reasons, or the Danes, or the Polish, or the Czechs. So that's number two. Number three, uh, the vast majority of the European Parliament are Europhiles. Uh, you, if you, this is my estimate, if you, uh, probably 80% of the participants in the, uh, of the MEPs, regardless whether they are on the left, or the Greens, or the Social Democrats, or the Christian Democrats or whatever, with the exception, interestingly, of the far right, unfortunately only, and some of the far left. So they are all in favor of the Euro. And uh, I have witnessed a lot of uh, uh, engagements of members of the European Central Bank in the European Parliament, including, of course, Mario Draghi. And uh, my, I am afraid that any attempt to get the European Parliament to control the ECB is futile, is hopeless. This will not happen. Uh, you can get the European Central Bank only to a reasonable policy like the one to which they committed originally when the Eurozone was, was started, only by the threats of some countries to leave the Euro. And I could tell you how uh, a lot of stories how Italian uh, people from the Five Star Movement <laughs> earlier tried to get out of the Euro and, and myself and others. It's hopeless. Uh, uh, we, we, need, uh, we need some countries to say, look, uh, we don't want to participate anymore. And uh, of course, the high inflation rate, which I see now coming, and the first signs you already see with the prices of real estate, with the prices of gold, by the way, we never talked about gold as a currency, we should have. And finally, the prices of the, of the industrial shares, uh, you already have the inflation. Uh, you already see the movement of a lot of people away from cash into different currencies. They are called, uh, apartment buildings or gold or shares of companies. So uh, I think the only uh, way to bring the ECB to its senses would be that the German government, which is the largest net payer of the European Union and which has the biggest risk by the target two uh, differences, uh, they are, we, the German government uh, must one day come to its senses and that will only happen if inflation starts. Once inflation is felt by the German consumers, and I would say the same might be true for the Dutch and the Austrians and uh, maybe the Finns, uh, <clears throat> only then we will get political pressure on the European Central Bank to start behaving like they should. Thank you, Mr. Henkel, also for this review of the, the last years of uh, 
of policy at the European Parliament uh, in regards also to the central bank. Thurston, I'm coming to you very, very quickly, just for a very quick uh, last remark. And I, I would love, you know, for me, it's a completely new argument. And, you know, I've been moderating a lot of uh, topics, but really this one is for me very new and I'm really getting to know a lot of things. Uh, but Thurston, just the last comment, uh, Mr. Henkel talk about gold system and I know you deal with gold a lot. Um, is that a possibility? Oh yes, it is. Um, it's important to have a free market in money. You know, I try to explain that central banking is is evil. It destroys freedom and liberties, and sooner or later, it will destroy our material well-being. I think that's the that's the truth. And the alternative is, of course, to set up to a free market in money, where people are free to decide which kind of money they would like to hold to to make transactions with. You know, maybe Pietro, do you decide for the Bitcoin? I go for a digitalized uh, gold-backed uh, coin. Um, and the market will play out and find what the most marketable uh, transaction medium will be. And um, I think gold would be a very strong candidate in that competition. And um, some states in the, in the United States of America, like Texas, Wyoming, Idaho, they have um, abolished any taxes on gold, silver, and also platinum, palladium. So people have the freedom to use gold or silver in their daily purchases in restaurants and supermarkets, or use, or they have the option to use the dollar. I think this is the way forward. You don't expect the the the, poli the politicians to 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 come up with a better idea for money. The only revolution that will be effective, will be bottom up. So people need the freedom to decide which kind of money they would like to hold. And um, if you would make me finance minister in Germany, I would do <laughs> just one thing and then step down. And that would be to abolish uh, VAT and capital gain taxes on Bitcoin and gold, silver, platinum, and other potential candidates that can serve as money. Thank you so much, uh, Thurston. Thank you so much, Mr. Henkel and of course Martin and well we know that we have at least for sure a candidate for the next uh, uh, election in Germany um, so today we have the first <laughs> the first coming out and of course you get our vote I don't vote in Germany but probably Mr. Henkel would support you hopefully and uh, uh, congratulations and good luck for that of course I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm teasing you but really you made a good point and we are going toward a we are in a technological revolution, but certainly the point we get today is not to eliminate or at least is not to limit uh, individual individual freedom and give the individual the power to make uh, choices, the right or the wrong choices, but to make the choice. And as liberal, we should ensure that we have a, 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 regular, a regulation or a law system that allows individuals to, to know because knowledge is the most important thing to make free choices. So thank you very much. For me, it was a wonderful seminar, more, more than anybody, any, any, anything else, because I learned a lot. And of course, I'm, I'm now more curious to learn. You know, Last time we talked about sugar, salt, we really changed and we really switched from different topics that are regarding always one thing. That's freedom and that's our liberty. Again, thank you very much for being here with us. Thanks to the uh, to the people that have been following us till now for the almost the full hour and there were more before but as we know they tend to leave thank you very much to everybody we see next month last third days of the month we'll come up with the next uh, topic i don't know the topic yet and um, we always decide in the next week so stay tuned you can again watch this uh, video online on the austrian economics uh, website and we report it on the confederate uh, website. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to Martin Texas Victoria for allowing us to be online and also my best to Brit in Vienna and to our friend Barbara Colm, always beloved one. Thank you very much everybody and Thank have a good you. evening.